Analysis A new intelligence report suggests that the lab leak wars will never end. Given a 90-day deadline to share what they know about COVID's origins, America's divided intelligence agencies produced a slim report that leaves both major hypotheses on the table and raises as many questions as it answers. End Friday evening, five days after a federally mandated deadline, the US government's Office of the Director of National Intelligence finally acted on its legal obligation to declassify any and all information regarding the origin of the COVID-19 pandemic and its possible links to a Wuhan laboratory complex. In the three plus years since COVID appended the lives of virtually every person on earth, a sprawling and often bitter debate has arisen among scientists, politicians, journalists, and online analysts over where the virus came from. Those favoring a natural spillover theory, in which the virus made the leap from bats to humans via an intermediate animal, have been dueling with lab leak proponents, who contend that it likely escaped from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which conducts cutting-edge and sometimes risky coronavirus research. Many hoped that the declassification exercise would bring new clarity, and maybe even resolution, to the debate. But when the ODNI finally weighed in at 6.25 p.m. Eastern Time on Friday, one thing seemed clear, the debate, accusations, and investigations will continue, perhaps indefinitely, in scientific papers, Twitter threads, and congressional hearings. Instead of releasing a tranche of redacted primary documents chronicling the agency's respective investigations, the ODNI chose to publish a summary of findings in a report of just nine pages, four of them taken up by a table of contents and a glossary. Among the few points of unambiguous agreement, the report notes, all agencies continue to assess that both a natural and laboratory-associated origin remain plausible hypotheses to explain the first human infection. As well, they concur that SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, was not developed as a biological weapon. The report contains a classified annex, which the ODNI did not release. The report may be more notable for what it doesn't say. It does not shed any light on why the National Intelligence Council and four other intelligence agencies assess that natural exposure to an infected animal is a more likely cause. It does not reveal why the FBI and Department of Energy both see a laboratory incident as more likely, or why they believe so for different reasons. Nor does it spell out why the CIA and another unidentified agency have declined to even make an assessment, except to say that both hypotheses rely on significant assumptions or face challenges with conflicting reporting. It's no figure of speech to say that the COVID origins debate has been thoroughly politicized. Republicans in Congress have sought to use suspicions of a lab leak cover-up as a cudgel against Dr. Anthony Fauci, the former director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. The National Institutes of Health, of which NIAID is a part, awarded a grant to a US-based organization, EcoHealth Alliance, that collaborated with the WIV on coronavirus research. On Friday, the House Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic announced a subpoena issued by the Committee on Oversight and Accountability to Dr. Christian Anderson, a virologist at Scripps Research Institute. Anderson was ordered to turn over all Slack messages related to the drafting of an influential early research paper, which Fauci reviewed, that cast a laboratory accident as implausible. Anderson and other authors of the Proximal Origin paper have also been summoned to testify in person before the subcommittee on July 11. Spokespeople for Scripps and Dr. Forsey did not respond to requests for comment. The order directing ODNI to declassify, however, was a bipartisan enterprise. The law mandating it was passed unanimously in Congress and signed by President Biden on March 20. Appearing on Face the Nation this Sunday, House Intelligence Committee Chair Mike Turner, Republican Ohio, said that the ODNI's declassification had not met the requirements set by law, 
We've asked to open the curtain and release the intelligence. And they went behind the curtain, read this stuff, and came out and said, well, this is what we think about it. This is not sufficient. He added that the result would be a battle between Congress and the Director of National Intelligence to make certain the law is complied with. Yesterday, that battle began, when two senators who sponsored and co-sponsored the COVID-19 Origin Act, Josh Hawley, Republican Missouri, and Mike Braun, Republican Indiana, respectively, sent a letter to ODNI Director Avril Haines, alleging that she failed to comply with the law. They invited her to try again and deliver a more fulsome declassification within seven business days or testify before Congress. Dr. Brad Wenstrup, Republican Ohio, Chairman of the Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic, tells Vanity Fair that the report leaves him scratching my head at the level of capability, or incapability, of the intelligence community to conduct an investigation regarding science. He adds that the agency's reasoning should be in this report. Why, he asks, are the assessments all so different? Why did they come to various conclusions? Were they looking at the same intelligence and, big question, who did they talk to? The Office of Representative Raul Ruiz, Democrat California, the ranking member of the Select Subcommittee, did not respond to an interview request. But in a letter he sent to Wenstrup on June 8, first published by the Washington Post, he accused the Republican-led subcommittee of pursuing a predetermined narrative that Dr. Anthony Fauci and Dr. Francis Collins were part of a lab created and leaked SARS-CoV-2 virus and then nefariously worked to suppress information and cover up how the pandemic began. Collins did not respond to a request for comment sent to NIH, where he served as director for more than 12 years. The ODNI did not respond to requests from Vanity Fair to discuss how the declassification process was conducted or to respond to congressional claims that its declassification did not comply with the law. In the first year of the pandemic, at a time when the lab leak hypothesis was widely condemned as a baseless conspiracy theory, a group of officials within the State Department fought to release evidence suggestive of a research-related incident. One of those officials was David Feith, a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the East Asia Bureau under Trump. Feith describes the declassification report as a missed opportunity and part of a years-long and escalating effort to undermine the public interest in knowing more about where one of the most catastrophic events in history appears to have originated. He says the US government has failed to operate with due transparency and candor about its central role in funding risky virology research, not only in the US, but in China and even at the very Wuhan lab that has been obviously in question for three and a half years. But Rear Admiral Kenneth Bernard, who established the National Security Council's first biodefense and health security office in 1998 under President Bill Clinton, said the intelligence agencies really don't know what the origin is, no matter how aghast the Twitter sphere is at the lack of forthcoming information. Rather than a lack of transparency, he detects a lack of interest. Once they concluded this wasn't development of an offensive biological weapon, the intelligence community became relatively uninterested, as did the administration. Whether it came from a natural outbreak or an inadvertent laboratory leak in China would not significantly change the policy approach, Bernard says. Both origin stories of a market or lab origin implicate China in not giving proper oversight to a dangerous practice. The report represents the placid tip of a large, disputatious iceberg. Its carefully hedged language points to continuing divisions of interpretation within the intelligence agencies, says Bernard. Collectively, the DNI is saying that both hypotheses are plausible, says Gerald Parker, who previously led the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases in Fort Detrick, Maryland. That is the consensus opinion they could come up with. The intelligence agencies are analysing information they are getting through their channels. If they say, there's no direct evidence SARS-CoV-2 was in the lab before December 2019, it doesn't mean it's not there. It just means they don't have direct evidence of it. 
The report notes that several WIV researchers fell ill in the fall of 2019 with some symptoms that were consistent with but not diagnostic of COVID-19. That information, first disclosed in a January 2021 State Department fact sheet, recently broke into the news when first a Substack publication, and then the Wall Street Journal, identified the sick researchers as three people who had done work in the lab of the WITH's top coronavirus scientist. Two of them subsequently told Science magazine that they had not been ill in the fall of 2019. Vanity Fair emailed all three for comment, as well as the lab's top coronavirus scientist, but received no reply. The report also acknowledges biosafety concerns at the WIV, a shortage of appropriately trained staff, a probable lack of inadequate biosafety precautions and efforts to improve training as well as systems for disinfection and ventilation in response to problems that had been identified. A report worked on by a Senate committee's Republican staff documented these issues and argued that they prompted high-level concern within China's government, as evidenced by a visit to the WIV from a senior Beijing biosafety official in November 2019. The ODNI report says that the visit appears routine rather than a response to a specific incident. It also finds that an inspection at the laboratory that identified problems after the pandemic began is not necessarily indicative of WITH's biosafety status prior to the outbreak. Florence Debar, a senior scientist at the French National Centre for Scientific Research, has been studying COVID origins with an international team of scientists who contend the pandemic began with a natural spillover. In her view, the declassification offered little evidence to support the lab leak hypothesis. To learn that nothing has been found is an important piece of information, Debar says. There is no evidence that the WIV had SARS-CoV-2 before late December 2019. There is no evidence that there were accidents at the WIV in November 2019, no evidence there were three sick researchers with COVID in a coronavirus lab group. Michael Werribe, an evolutionary virologist at the University of Arizona, co-wrote an influential research paper, which used a geospatial analysis of early cases in Wuhan to argue that the virus originated at the Huanan wholesale seafood market there, leaping from infected animals to humans to start the pandemic. He believes that the natural origin hypothesis is the only explanation that comports with the available data. I didn't have any expectation that there would be major revelations that would change my thinking, he says of the declassification, adding that there is very clear scientific evidence that the virus started with wildlife sales at one of the four markets in Wuhan consistently selling these live animals. In the days since the ODNI report was issued, several commentators have attempted to use its sparse and couched language to conclusively dismiss the lab leak hypothesis. But the four agencies, including the National Intelligence Council, that favor a natural origin do so only with low confidence. Clearly, the intelligence agencies don't think that the evidence of a natural origin is dispositive, says Bernard. Low confidence means it's barely over the 50 50 line. David Asher, a former senior investigator under contract to the State Department, helped lead the review there that ended in January 2021. He says during that time, we asked the intelligence community for information pertinent to natural origins, full stop, what did they know? I can't tell you what they knew, but I never saw a scintilla of evidence showing a natural origin. He says that, by contrast, the State Department team had more information two and a half years ago indicating a lab leak than is reflected in the current declassification, and he claims that some of that information still has not been disseminated. The strongest assessment of moderate confidence comes from the FBI, which views a lab leak as more likely. Of all the intelligence agencies, says Parker, the FBI has the most experience in investigating biological threats including lab breaches and purposeful attacks. The FBI has established laboratories to support this work, and has developed procedures and protocols 
he says, in part due to its experience investigating the 2001 anthrax attacks. Parker was an expert advisor on the GOP Senate report released earlier this year. Two congressional investigators tell VF that, according to records they have reviewed, the FBI appears to have done the most legwork of any intelligence agency in formulating its assessment. The records, which document interviews and meetings with outside experts, have not been made public. Another expert cautions that the FBI's emphasis on law enforcement may bias its assessment. Since the pandemic began, the intelligence community's few public disclosures have evolved slightly over time, exposing small shifts in how the different agencies weigh different evidence, depending on their expertise. The most notable shift was that of the Department of Energy, which changed its assessment from undecided to low confidence that a lab leak had occurred, according to Fresh Intelligence, as the Wall Street Journal reported in February. The Energy Department oversees a network of 17 national labs, including the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California, which possesses advanced national security capabilities. On April 30, 2020, the ODNI put out a statement that the intelligence community concurs with the wide scientific consensus that the COVID-19 virus was not man-made or genetically modified, but would continue to assess whether the outbreak began through contact with infected animals or if it was the result of an accident at a laboratory in Wuhan. If a scientific consensus ever really existed, it has long since fractured. The declassified report now says that almost all IC agencies believe SARS-CoV-2 was not genetically engineered, and most agencies believe it was not adapted in a laboratory using scientific techniques that can hasten evolutionary change in a virus. But the report notes that some agencies are unable to make a determination on these points. The fact that it's proven so challenging to answer this question in a way that is satisfying to everyone highlights that the capabilities in the United States and internationally to resolve these kinds of open questions are very weak, says Jamie Yassif, Vice President of Global Biological Policy and Programs for the Nuclear Threat Initiative. We have a lot of work to do domestically and internationally to shore up our capabilities. How, then? Will the US arrive at something approaching a resolution on the origins of COVID-19, and who will the ultimate adjudicators be? Parker says, nothing short of a bipartisan, congressionally authorized commission will suffice, and I am not sure even that will any more. Additional reporting by Catherine Lee. A big week for the lab leak making sense of the latest twists in the COVID-19 origins debate. New reports reveal that the Department of Energy and FBI take the laboratory hypothesis very seriously indeed. Could it be enough to prompt a bipartisan inquiry into what caused the pandemic? Or those tracking the contentious debate over COVID-19's origins, it's been quite a few days. On Tuesday, FBI Director Christopher Wray publicly acknowledged that the Bureau considers an accidental biohazard leak from a laboratory in China to be the likeliest cause of the COVID-19 pandemic. The assessment had been made in August 2021 as part of an intelligence review ordered by President Biden. In an interview that aired on Fox News yesterday, Wray broke his silence on the matter, saying, the FBI has for quite some time now assessed that the origins of the pandemic are most likely a potential lab incident in Wuhan. He added, here you are talking about a potential leak from a Chinese government-controlled lab. Ray's remarks came on the heels of a report in Sunday's Wall Street Journal, which revealed that the US Department of Energy had changed its position on the pandemic's origins, based on new intelligence. The DOE now takes the view, albeit with low confidence, that COVID-19 most likely arose from a lab leak. 
The new assessment was noted in a classified intelligence report that was recently provided to the White House and certain members of Congress. This one-two punch of revelations immediately changed the optics, if not the ground-level reality, of the highly politicized and frequently toxic debate over COVID-19's origins, which I first began reporting on in 2021. To be sure, there is still no clear proof that the virus escaped from a laboratory. But for the first time in at least two years, the possibility of a lab leak is being taken seriously even by many who previously considered it to be a baseless conspiracy theory. For months, Democrats in Congress have declined to pursue a bipartisan inquiry into COVID-19's origins, and the Biden administration did not press to include a plan for a bipartisan commission that would have examined the question in the last spending bill. Their hesitation was perhaps understandable, given the vehemence with which Republicans have pursued an openly partisan campaign to lay the blame for the pandemic at the feet of Dr. Anthony Fauci, the recently retired head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. There's no guarantee that the events of the past few weeks will change Democrats' calculus, but yesterday Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer appeared to acknowledge that the possibility of a so-called lab leak deserves to be taken seriously. The bottom line is we've got to get to the bottom of this, the journal quoted Schumer as saying. The Biden administration is committed to it. They have all kinds of people looking at it, and we'll wait to see their results. A Schumer spokesman would not say whether the senator now supports a bipartisan inquiry. For now, the outstanding questions far outnumber the answers. There is fragmentary and circumstantial evidence supporting two credible but dueling hypotheses. One, that SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, spilled over to humans from an infected animal at the wet market in Wuhan where the disease first exploded into view, or two, that the virus originated in a nearby laboratory in Wuhan. The Wuhan Institute of Virology, which was known to pursue risky coronavirus research, is roughly eight miles from the market. Even closer sits the Wuhan Center for Disease Control and Prevention, which also operates laboratories. The World Health Organization, which has been largely stonewalled by China in its efforts to probe the pandemic's origin, contends that both hypotheses remain on the table. China has long denied that COVID-19 originated from a Wuhan laboratory, or even within its borders. On Monday, a Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson said at a press briefing, the origin of the novel coronavirus is a scientific issue and should not be politicized. As of last night, it was not clear what new intelligence led the Department of Energy to change its assessment. That information, which remains classified, was reportedly shared with other intelligence agencies, which did not alter their assessments. But the shift by the Department of Energy is notable, as it funds and oversees a network of 17 national laboratories, including the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California, which possesses advanced national security capabilities. Dr. Robert Redfield, the former director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention under President Trump, says that both the Energy Department and the FBI have a huge scientific workforce, making their assessments of a lab origin significant. Others are reserving judgment until more details emerge. It's very difficult to say anything until we see what information drove this updated analysis, says Stephen Goldstein, a postdoctoral research associate in evolutionary virology at the University of Utah, who co-authored an influential research paper linking COVID-19's origin to the wet market. The Energy Department showed it to other agencies and they did not change their assessments, and it's low confidence, Goldstein adds. If the data exists and is declassified and I can update my own analysis, wonderful. In May 2021, President Biden ordered the US intelligence community, including the FBI, CIA, and officers at the Departments of State and Energy, to conduct a 90-day review of the origins question. 
A declassified account of their findings reflected broad consensus on several key points. That SARS-CoV-2 likely first appeared in Wuhan no later than November 2019, that it emerged without the foreknowledge of China's government, and that it was not developed as a bioweapon. Most agencies also agreed that the virus probably was not genetically engineered, though two agencies believed they did not have enough evidence to make a determination. The agencies split, however, over the question of how the virus made the leap to humans. The National Intelligence Council and four other agencies favored a natural origin, albeit with low confidence, and three others remained undecided. One unnamed agency, which turned out to be the FBI, assessed with moderate confidence that the first human infection with SARS-CoV-2 most likely resulted from a laboratory-associated incident, probably involving experimentation, animal handling, or sampling by the Wuhan Institute of Virology, the summary stated. This sober-minded inquiry by intelligence professionals unfolded in stark contrast to the often bitter debate raging in the press and on social media. In the early days of the pandemic, the claim that COVID-19 leaked from a laboratory was part of a broader conspiratorial narrative pushed by fringe figures. Steve Bannon, a far-right advisor to President Trump, linked arms with a Hong Kong billionaire to elevate wild and unsupported claims, such as the notion that the Chinese Communist Party had developed COVID-19 as a bioweapon. In April 2020, after President Trump asserted, without offering evidence, from the White House podium that the virus had come from a Wuhan laboratory, the political battle lines hardened. The mere suggestion that a laboratory leak might have occurred became associated with xenophobic, anti-scientific, and often flatly untrue claims being driven from the right. Even as more legitimate questions surfaced around the lab leak hypothesis, most mainstream media continued to present the market origin as settled science, and one that enjoyed a consensus among scientists. One set of studies, in particular, led scientists and journalists to continue asserting that the spillover theory was far likelier than the lab alternative. In July, a group of leading virologists published two peer-reviewed papers that analyzed early cases of infected patients in Wuhan using geospatial mapping. They concluded that SARS-CoV-2 occurred through the live wildlife trade in China and that the Wuhan market was the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic. On Monday, Fawcett told the Boston Globe at a health and biotech conference that he believes that the mapping analysis rather strongly suggests that the virus emerged as a natural occurrence. Stephen Goldstein, one of the paper's co-authors, says that although he believes the evidence points strongly to the market in Wuhan, we acknowledge in the paper, there are still elements of this that are unknown. Over the last two years, however, a more complex picture has emerged, bit by bit, due to the work of Freedom of Information research groups, a small number of scientists and journalists, and a group of online sleuths calling themselves drastic. It turned out that the National Institutes of Health NIE, had allowed a US scientific research nonprofit called EcoHealth Alliance to provide subgrants of federal funding to the Wuhan Institute of Virology at WIV, which were used to support risky coronavirus research. The Department of Health and Human Services Inspector General recently determined that the NIE had failed to appropriately oversee the central grant in question. It also turned out that some of the earliest and most persuasive arguments against a possible laboratory origin came from scientists who initially suspected a lab origin was likely, as revealed in emails obtained through Freedom of Information requests. And it emerged that EcoHealth Alliance, in partnership with a University of North Carolina virologist and the WIT's top coronavirus researcher, had in March 2018 sought a grant from the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA. As part of their grant application, they proposed to insert a feature known as a furin cleavage site into unidentified SARS-like bat coronaviruses to assess their ability to infect cells. This raised eyebrows given that one of the most notable features of SARS-CoV-2 is its unique furin cleavage site, 
not found in any other known SARS-like virus. DARPA declined to fund the grant, determining that the proposal had failed to adequately assess the risks of the research. The president of EcoHealth Alliance, Peter Daszak, has said that to his knowledge none of the collaborating partners on the grant continued the research, but it's unclear whether it nevertheless went forward in some way. Lawrence Tabak, acting director of the NIH, recently testified at a hearing held by the House Energy and Commerce Committee that the viruses the WIV studied using his agency's funding could not have sparked the pandemic as they bear no relationship to SARS-CoV-2. They are genetically distinct. But the full picture of the work that was done at the Wuhan Institute of Virology remains shielded from public view. The WIV first took down its extensive database of virus sequences in September 2019, and it remains offline today. With critical information still out of reach, scientists and sleuths have battled continually over the few available clues. The Ransa, meanwhile, has ratcheted up to a point that scientists on both sides of the debate have received death threats. Virologists who early in the pandemic advised the government, particularly the NIH, find themselves facing hostile GOP congressional committees and the prospect of subpoenas. Probing the virus's origin is important, says Goldstein. But some of the rhetoric of those congressional letters is so hostile from the jump that it alienates people from wanting to participate in those investigations. He has not been personally targeted, but some of his co-authors have. For those who have seriously studied the question of whether COVID-19 could have originated from a laboratory, it has been a difficult and lonely road. Alina Chen, a molecular biologist at the Broad Institute in Boston, was one of the first scientists to argue that COVID-19 may have originated in a lab. She has argued her case on Twitter and Carr published a book, Viral, exploring the question with a British science writer, Matt Ridley. Throughout, she has been relentlessly assailed online by critics, including establishment scientists, who denounce her as a conspiracy theorist and grifter. Some powerful proponents of the natural spillover hypothesis have gone out of their way to degrade and intimidate those asking for a fair investigation of the lab leak theory, Chan told Vanity Fair. No matter how much abuse they heap on us, the lab leak has always been a plausible origin of the pandemic. Amid the overheated debate, journalists investigating the possibility have also been targeted. In October, Critics demanded that ProPublica and Vanity Fair retract an investigative report on the Wuhan Institute of Virology, arguing that it relied in part on faulty translations of Chinese language documents. An extensive review by both publications affirmed that the reporting was sound and that the lab leak hypothesis is an essential avenue for exploration. Since the Wall Street Journal story on Sunday, even the comedian Jon Stewart has expressed bewilderment at the attacks he faced after he joked to Stephen Colbert in June 2021 that it was obvious COVID-19 came from a Wuhan laboratory. As he noted on his Apple TV Plus podcast Monday, the larger problem with all of this is the inability to discuss things that are within the realm of possibility without falling into absolutes and litmus testing each other for our political allegiances. Without cooperation from China's government, which virtually no one believes is forthcoming, it will be difficult if not impossible to say for sure how the pandemic began. But US efforts to shed light on the question and prevent future pandemics continue all the same. As the intelligence agencies weigh declassifying crucial information and GOP-led congressional committees continue to pursue hearings, the Biden administration appears poised to move forward with more stringent regulations of risky pathogen research despite the opposition of many virologists. The fact that it's plausible that a lab accident could have caused a global pandemic is a wake-up call for all of us, says Jamie Yassif, Vice President of Global Biological Policy and Programs for the Nuclear Threat Initiative. If we don't take bold action now to guard against accidental or deliberate misuse of bioscience and biotechnology, we could face catastrophic consequences in the future 
which could be as bad as COVID or worse. This sober-minded inquiry by intelligence professionals unfolded in stark contrast to the often bitter debate raging in the press and on social media.